Hello, this is Ed Markey speaking. Welcome to the Ed Markey Podcast. Okay, so... Let me know. So uh, welcome uh, again, and today we have a special guest star, uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren, my partner in the United States Senate from the state of Massachusetts, uh, and she has been a huge leader on all progressive issues. But on this clean energy revolution, it's been something that she's especially been focusing upon. And I thought it would be great if we could have a little conversation about that today. And uh, so welcome, uh, Thank Elizabeth. You. Welcome, um, my friend. Good. Um, so can we talk about transportation? Talk oh, about, I'm I'll for let, transportation. Talk about electric buses. Yes. Talk about your passion for that. Yes, yes, yes. Now, look, I have to start by saying love being your partner. Best partner ever in the United States Senate. But you're the one who leads on green. I'm just learning what I can and in the fights where I can help at any point. But for me, I got to say, these green school buses, uh, the idea that we are switching from diesel school buses to electric school buses is huge. And it's huge. I think about the parts that we will never explicitly be able to put a finger on who got helped. So yeah, it's that we don't see these dirty school buses belching uh, uh, all this carbon dioxide and other particulates out into the air, um, uh, particularly in vulnerable communities where we know there's a lot of this that goes on. But it's all little kids who aren't breathing that crap. And as a result, who don't end up with asthma attacks, who don't end up in emergency rooms, who sometimes don't even have to end up, some of them get hospitalized now. By taking those filthy school buses off the roads and substituting these green school buses, these new energy-efficient all-electric school buses, our kids are healthier. And you just can't put a price tag on that. So I just want to start right there. Every time I see one of those school buses whiz by, I think, yes, that is a sign of America's future and doing it right. Well, let me put a price tag on it. Okay. Okay. So, um, 90% of all the school buses in Massachusetts are on diesel. Yeah, I know. Now. Doesn't it make you choke, literally and figuratively? It's unbelievable. Yep. Now, we were able mm -hmm. to win $63 million yes, for yes, the state yes. of Massachusetts for electric buses mm -hmm. in New Bedford, mm -hmm. Fall River. Pioneer Lawrence, Valley. Mm -hmm. Boston. Mm -hmm. So, can you talk about that and in, in, in this this transition that has to get funded, mm -hmm. uh, but once it does, these cities are stepping up. Okay, so, you know, for some people who are listening, they may not know, buses really cost a lot. Those school buses are pricey items, about three hundred and fifty to $400,000, you know? You, it's a lot of money. And school districts, they, they understand the point I was making. They don't want their kids breathing that stuff, but they just don't have the money to lay out for a whole new fleet. So this bill that we got through Congress that you led on actually puts us in a place where piece at a time, you just keep peeling it out. One more school district, one more set of buses. We'll have 50 new school buses in Boston alone in this latest tranche of money. So that we're making this transition from the dirty buses to the clean buses and doing it in a way that a school district doesn't have to lay off teachers or, you know, close up a wing of a building in order to be able to afford. And, and you know what I love? That it's set up so it's not only the money for the school buses. Woohoo! Every school bus comes with its own little special $20,000 to build a charging station. And I'm hoping for most of these, how about some solar panels? And now let's talk about how the economics shift. And that means for a school district that they go from a diesel bus, which means uh, you got to buy diesel, right, every week. Um, and you have a lot of repairs on those things because there's a lot of moving parts to brand new buses that uh, require less maintenance and that you can operate 
if you do it right, you can operate pretty much for free. That changes the economics for a school district, not just on transportation, changes the economics overall. That means school districts spend a little more money on teaching, a little more money on other services that those kids need, a little more money on maintenance around their buildings. This is like win, 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 win. And throw in, if you would, the environmental justice issue, black, brown, poor communities, mm -hmm. where these buses are going. Yeah. and and. We do have to remember that because well, there are a lot of folks who talk about climate, we talk about it overall, and we should keep in mind that there are some communities that got hit just for decades now, centuries now, harder than others. And the places where waste was dumped, where uh, plants were located that belched soot and filth out, and so we've got communities, largely black and brown communities, that have just had the wrong end of every piece of environmental damage that we were doing and to this And by the way, can earth. I just interject? Springfield, Please. two years ago, won the dubious distinction of having the worst asthma rates yep. in the United States of America. And that's the reminder how this stuff all links back together. We talk a lot, and we should, about rising ocean rates or bigger storms. But remember, the effects of this kind of pollution, particularly from, from these diesel fumes, is felt family by family, child by child. Um, elderly person by elderly person, uh, people who are undergoing chemotherapy, people who are more vulnerable to anything that gets into the air. This is the worst possible stuff for them, the, the parts that are coming out of these diesel buses. So making that shift is about saving the whole world, but it's also about saving individual people right at home. Exactly. Now, in order to have the buses that are all electric mm -hmm. be safer mm -hmm. so that they're not using electricity generated by natural gas or other fossil fuels, we need an offshore wind revolution in Massachusetts, which you're passionate about. Yeah. Because if we bring in 800 megawatts, which mm -hmm. we're going to do with Vineyard Wind and then have it uh, succeeded by other offshore wind projects, then we're moving. We've we're got moving. We've got momentum. We're moving. Talk about that if you would. So your I, passion I, for that. Yeah, issue. so I was just down in New Bedford not long ago. You and I have been there yeah. over and over and over, you know, as we've watched this project. We thought it was off the ground and then it comes back. And, you know, we've this has been a challenge and going on for a long time now. But I was down there while they were kind of hitting the next phase of putting up the blades. They were getting ready to take the blades out to the site. And I I hope people understand the magnitude of what we're talking about here. Offshore wind is about building a new, reliable, huge energy source that's gonna revolutionize how we think about energy over time. Unlike onshore wind, which sometimes blows and sometimes does not, offshore wind blows all the time and it blows stronger, and we in Massachusetts just happen to be right next to one of the, um, uh, the, the most ideal sites for offshore wind of any place in the world. So laying down the infrastructure, getting those, getting those, those wind turbines up, but also the offline power so that we can start bringing that power online. And, I don't know how you look at this, Ed, but the way I see it is it's both the energy we produce now with the offshore wind, but it's also the proof of concept. It's to start showing the rest of America. Now, Europe's been doing this for a yeah. while, parts of Europe, but start showing the rest of America. You don't have to burn fossil fuels. You don't have to burn dirty stuff in order to be able to light your homes and run your businesses. We can do a lot of this offshore, it's out there, it's clean, and invest in the infrastructure, and it's, it's infinitely renewing. And Massachusetts is going first. We and are. the natural we gas are. industry hates it <laughs> because they say, oh, we need natural gas mm -hmm. to 
provide the electricity for homes, for mm -hmm. businesses. And by the way, we really do support nuclear power plants. Mm -hmm. And if you shut down the Pilgrim nuclear power plant, 600 megawatts, it's going to be a disaster mm -hmm. for the economy. Well, Vineyard Wind is 800 megawatts. And Wait, do those it, numbers again? So we were it, doing nuclear with 600, 600 megawatts. and Vineyard Wind. 800 megawatts. Woo. And behind it is another 800 megawatts yeah. and another 800 megawatts yeah. and another 800 megawatts, as you were saying, because um, we are in pretty much the windiest place yep. right off the coast of Massachusetts yep. uh, and New England in the world. So that's a big, big change and they're fighting it hard the yeah. fossil fuel industry well they see the handwriting on the wall here i mean this is no surprise why would anyone say i want to keep investing in and i want to keep using a product that's putting more carbon into the air that's more dangerous that i gotta breathe that i gotta build these pipeline infrastructures for when i can get something that's clean and renewable and it's right there off the shore of Massachusetts. And it is driving them crazy because they want to export LNG out of yeah. the United States as well. And the projects that they want to propose are the equivalent of 500 coal-burning plants. And we only have 217 coal-burning plants left in the United States. Yeah. So that's how bad they are. That's how bad these climate deniers are. Yeah. Uh, and your leadership, you know, on... On all these issues, it's just so, so historic. So thank you for that. And uh, and thank you for being on this little conversation that we're having. But I'd like to end it up, if I could, by playing a game that I like to call Big Oil or Movie Villain. <laughs> Big Oil or Movie okay. Villain. Okay, Big and Oil, Movie we'll Villain. Go, I'm going to have gonna, to I'm pick gonna, here. I'm going to read okay. you a quote. Okay. And you tell me whether you think that person... Uh, was a big oil executive. Okay. Or was it a movie villain? Okay, a so made are you up. Are you ready? Okay, okay, I'm ready. Up I'm first. ready. Okay. Quote, burn it until it smolders. Ooh. Burn it until it smolders. Big oil executive, movie villain. Oh, that one's got to be a movie villain. Smolder is what makes you. It brings to your brain exactly how much damage this is doing. You did know, I get it? Well, Professor, yes, you did. Okay. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and it's Frollo from the Hunchback of Notre Dame. Whoa. But it's also exactly what the oil executives oh. are doing to our planet. Yeah, but they don't want to say it that clearly. <laughs> well, let's keep going. Oh, let's all right. See. Okay. Okay. So okay. here's one more. We'll okay. see where you are. I'm ready. Um, our commitment... Our commitment was not without risk and was often criticized. Oh, Big boo oil, hoo. Um, <laughs> Our commitment was not without risk but was often criticized. Okay, so I'm guessing that kind of I am the multimillionaire slash billionaire victim here is probably a real CEO. It is a real CEO. It's Darren Woods, the CEO of Exxon Mobil. So you're, yeah, right now, you're, you're two for two. Ding, ding, ding. Two for okay. two. Now we go for the big conclusion. Okay, okay. Right. One more. Did we join some of those shadow groups? Yes. But there was nothing illegal about that. Oh, God. Did we join some of those shadow groups? Yeah. But there's nothing illegal about that. Big oil? A movie villain. You know, I so wish I could say movie villain. But this is what gets me. I think that's really big oil because I think that's exactly what they've done. And that's Keith McCoy, Exxon Mobil lobbyist. It did sound a little bit like Darth Vader. Oh, it totally it's did. It's not easy to distinguish these guys, but because they're so similar in terms of their attitude about um, about the people who live on our planet and the planet itself. But you're right, three for three. Three for three. But you know. think about that last one, because that last one is really saying, I will do anything I possibly can to boost my profits, and I'm not going to take one more look at how many little kids suck in the fumes, at how many storms, at how much sea rises, at what the environmental damage is all around the globe. I'm just going to make my fight, my stand is going to be 
You didn't make that illegal. Yeah. And if it's not, I'm taking my money and running. Yeah. And I can see the harm it's doing yep. to poor communities. Don't care. La, la, la. Asthma, I can't hear you. The planet. Yep. Who cares? So um, perfect score. Mm. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and, but it also, I think, motivates both of us yeah. to just keep working harder yeah. with the grassroots movement across our country, the Green New Deal movement yep. that is making all the difference in the way the politics in our country are being played. So thank you, my partner. And let me just say how grateful I am that you are leading this movement because this is how we're going to make real change. Stay after these guys. The great Elizabeth Warren. Thanks for joining us.